This is Randy Shell, and I'm making a video cast on the topic anesthesia pharmacology. It's part of our keyword review, and it's part two of a three part series on anesthesia pharmacology, and it's part of the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology Didactics. What are we going to cover in part two? Opioids, IV induction agents, and begin talking about inhaled anesthetics. So let's start right in on opioids, and the keyword is sites of action. Where do they act? In the periaqueductal gray area in the brainstem. The picture at the far right is meant to show that. Substantia gelatinosa in the spinal cord, lamina rexid 2. You can see how uh, pain nerves coming in could have the pain signals modulated if the opioids are working there. At receptors such as mu1 receptors, which cause analgesia, and they're present both supraspinally and spinally and mu2 receptors which can cause respiratory depression and bradycardia and there's other subtypes but we mainly focus on the mu receptor as the site of action of opioids. How do opioids work? What's their mechanism of action? They bind to that mu receptor and inhibit release of neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine and dopamine, norepinephrine and substance P. It is a G protein coupled receptors, these mu receptors, that then result in inhibition of cyclic AMP formation and then inhibition of calcium movement presynaptically such that if calcium doesn't move in presynaptically, the neurotransmitters aren't released as much. They also cause the opioids when they bind to mu receptors postsynaptically a efflux of potassium. So moving a positive ion from the inside to the outside makes it more negative inside or hyperpolarization and if that nerve is carrying pain no no susception or pain uh, sensation. So if we go at the graphic go to the graphic on the far right you can see an afferent C fiber C fibers uh, carrying pain and a mu binding uh, by morphine there and a G protein uh, coupling this to a reduction in cyclic AMP and then calcium not moving as much inside presynaptically and therefore less of whatever neurotransmitter is present there such as substance P would not be released. Then postsynaptically morphine again binding to a mu receptor G protein coupled and causing potassium to move outside hyperpolarizing the uh, membrane and decreasing nociceptive transmission. Cardiovascular and hemodynamic effects of the opioids. When a patient is hypertensive and tachycardic and we say they're light, we often will give them uh, fentanyl or sufentanyl, and we realize that sympathetic output can be decreased, um, but they also increase parasympathetic tone. <clears throat> there is no significant myocardial direct depression by opioids like fentanyl, sufentanyl, and remifentanyl. The exception is Mepiridine, Demerol, when it's given in high doses, it is a myocardial depressant. When you give an opioid, their heart rate often goes down. When you give Remifentanyl as a bolus, watch what happens to your heart rate. Quite significant bradycardia, usually. There are several mechanisms other than just decreasing sympathetic output. One is stimulation of the central vagus nuclei in the brain, causing reflex uh, bradycardia transmission via the vagus nerve to the heart and slowing it. An exception to this bradycardia, again, is Demerol or meperidine, and the structure, the chemical structure of meperidine looks like atropine, and meperidine actually can cause tachycardia. So in general, opioids cause bradycardia, two mechanisms, decreasing sympathetic output and stimulation of the central vagal nucleus. Hypotension can occur secondary to uh, stimulation of that uh, central vagal nucleus and the brain stem being stimulated. Um, and the heart rate can slow, the blood vessels, uh, both arterial and venous systems can dilate, and patients who are giving uh, opioids, if they stand up rapidly, can have orthostasis. What about histamine? Is it released by opioids? Meperidine, much more than morphine, and not clinically significant with sufentanyl, fentanyl, and remifentanyl. So if you go to the recovery room and a patient has been given morphine in an IV, and you see a little red streak up their arm in the vein just above the IV. That is release of histamine along the blood vessel. It's not technically an allergic reaction. It's release of histamine. And itching can occur with the ones that release histamine. So we would associate that with morphine and meperidine. Methadone, 
can prolong the QT interval. That's a cardiovascular effect. And if the QT interval is prolonged and you had an R on T, you could get torsades to points, which is polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, shown graphically just below the word torsade to points. And uh, we need to keep that in mind. And when we give methadone to patients, it may increase the risk of torsades. What's the effect of opioids on the brain? Effect on the EEG and SSEP first, uh, not a whole lot on SSEPs. That's part of the reason we use it as part of our TIVA anesthetic for monitoring of SSEPs and motor evoke potentials. And not the classic EEG effect anyway of our induction agents on the uh, EEG. In fact, if you give high doses of remifentanil, it doesn't classically affect the BIS like our other anesthetics do. So an opioid-based anesthetic may not decrease the BIS as much. High doses, however, of opioids are associated with some slowing of the EEG and delta wave activity. Remember that delta and theta waves are the slow waves. Alpha and beta waves are the faster waves in our brain. And meperidine is one that its metabolite normopyridine that can build up in patients with renal failure can cause seizures. Now, fentanyl is associated with lowering of the seizure threshold. So uh, if you had, for example, local anesthetic systemic toxicity where you gave fentanyl as your premedicant, fentanyl could lower the seizure threshold as opposed to, for example, midazolam as a premedication before a nerve block where you got local anesthetic systemic toxicity, midazolam would raise the seizure threshold. Opioids have a slight reduction in blood flow metabolism to the head, but not nearly as much as our drugs like propofol and atomidate and uh, the barbiturates, which we're going to talk about a bit later. Opioids do reduce MAC, and when you give an opioid as a bolus, we know that we can turn on our volatile anesthetics oftentimes, but there's a ceiling effect. That is, opioids are not a total anesthetic. No matter how much you give, you cannot uh, reduce it to zero MAC, for example. Elderly patients, we tend to decrease the dose in about half because their brains are sensitive um, to opioids. So this is a pharmacodynamic sensitivity effect, uh, and this includes remifentanil. Um, they also tend to have a little bit decreased clearance, and if their kidneys aren't working as well, they may not clear some of the metabolites of our opioids. So elderly patients reducing the dose because of a pharmacodynamic increased brain sensitivity to opioids. If we blast a patient with uh, opioids, these potent synthetic opioids like sufentanil, fentanyl, and remifentanil, they are associated with stiff chest syndrome, which is a centrally mediated brain. Don't mean GABA probably, but what happens is the skeletal muscles of the body, especially the chest and the larynx, can become rigid and close in the case of the larynx. And if you have the chest wall muscles very tight and the larynx closed, you can imagine how difficult it would be to try to mass ventilate the patient. Basically impossible. How can you reverse the stiff chest syndrome? Neuromuscular blockade, rocuronium, for example, or uh, naloxone, you could antagonize the opioid. However, then you would have a patient with no analgesia on board or possibly awake. And so neuromuscular blockade is the usual treatment for stiff chest syndrome. That skeletal muscle rigidity and laryngeal muscle closure that can occur with um, big doses of synthetic opioids. Some of the opioids have even some local anesthetic effect, meperidine being the classic one that can actually be put in the subarachnoid space and cause uh, spinal anesthesia. Opioid tolerance and hyperalgesia. If you have prolonged exposure to opioids, there's activation of the NMDA receptors. Uh, and this seems to be important in the development of opioid tolerance and the hyperalgesia, which is increased pain sensitivity that can occur. The side effect of opioids of constipation and the pupillary constriction that occurs with opioids seems to be the least likely to develop tolerance to. So you can keep taking opioids and get tolerant to many of the things that are associated with their administration, but not the constipation and the pupillary constriction. Respiratory effects, minute ventilation goes down, mainly the respiratory rate goes down, but at very high doses, the tidal volume can also start to decrease. The medullary respiratory centers, the ventilatory response to carbon dioxide is impaired and the CO2 response curve is shifted to the right. The hypoxic drive is blunted, the apneic threshold goes up, 
uh, and the maximum respiratory depression that occurs is about five to seven minutes after fentanyl, about 20 to 30 minutes after IV morphine, and uh, occurs quicker even with remifentanil. And if you give an opioid with co-administered with a benzodiazepine like midazolam, there's potentiation of that respiratory depression. Opioids don't interfere with hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, such as if you were doing one lung ventilation, adding opioids to your uh, anesthetic, don't expect them to inhibit HPV, and switching from a volatile anesthetic to a TIVA-based anesthetic in some cases might improve oxygenization because volatile anesthetics impair HPV. Renal effects and metabolites of opioids. A single dose of morphine, we don't really even worry much about this in a patient with renal uh, failure, for example. But if someone has renal failure and you're given repetitive doses of opioids, you really need to be well aware of the metabolites. So let's look at each one. Morphine first. Morphine, you can have accumulation of 6-glucuronide metabolite. Uh, the liver actually puts a glucuronide in the 6th position, creating this active uh, metabolite, 6-glucuronide, and a 3-glucuronide metabolite, which tends to be inactive. The 6th metabolite is a potent analgesic and sedative effects. So morphine, repetitively, in a patient with renal failure, multiple doses, chronic administration, probably not a great idea. You're going to accumulate this active metabolite, 6-glucuronide which is made by conjugation of a glucuronide in the sixth position on morphine. Meperidine, if you don't have good kidneys, uh, normaperidine is the metabolite and it can cause seizures. Hydromorphone or dilated is metabolized to hydromorphone 3 glucuronide, again, a, a putting a sugar molecule on the opioid. And this is an active metabolite also, like morphine. And this metabolite can actually cause cognitive dysfunction, excitation, myoclonus, and it's excreted by the kidney. So hydromorphone, dilated, not the greatest choice. Codeine can cause prolonged narcosis, not recommended. Fentanyl doesn't have active metabolites, so it's good for use in end-stage renal disease. And remifentanil would be obviously the best if you're worried about kidney or renal failure because it has no effect on clearance, either of those organ dysfunctions. But you're still going to decrease the dose in the elderly by about half because of the increased sensitivity of the brain of the elderly to opioids. Methadone is considered relatively safe and doesn't have active metabolites. So the recommendations for opioids and renal failure up at the top right, we're not going to give codeine, fentanyl is okay, um, dilated, we're going to use cautiously, there's better ones probably, methadone is safe, Demerol we're not going to give, and morphine we're not going to give, or tramadol. Here's a question for you. A patient anesthetized with desflurane with rocuronium, neuromuscular blockade, and undergoing a thoracotomy with one lung ventilation is given a bolus of remifentanil one mic per kilogram. The most likely effect of this one mic per kilogram bolus of remifentanil would be stiff chest syndrome. No, they're paralyzed with rocuronium. Decreased cardiac contractility. Opioids don't uh, reduce cardiac contractility except meperidine in high doses. Decreased heart rate. Absolutely. Bradycardia from decreasing sympathetic outflow and stimulation of the central vagal nucleus. And it doesn't inhibit HPV, so you're not going to expect a decrease in PaO2. Next topic is opioids and monamine oxidase inhibitors, and specifically focusing on serotonin syndrome. Meperidine, if it's combined with an MAO inhibitor like selegiline, phenylzine, tranylcypromine, drugs that may be given to patients with Parkinson's disease or intractable um, uh, problems with depression. They can get a life-threatening reaction called serotonin syndrome from the increase in serotonin that, that occurs when these two drugs are given together. Patient looks almost like MH in that their, their temperature can go up, their blood pressure can go up, they can be sweating and rigid and excitation and seizures, coma and death. Uh, morphine and fentanyl don't seem to cause this. Tramadol we avoid in patients with MAO inhibitors also, just like meperidine we're going to avoid, because it not only is a mu receptor agonist, but also increases serotonin and norepinephrine. And it is actually a prodrug metabolized by that CYP2D6 system, which metabolizes about 25% of our drugs, including codeine, codeine activation, to its active form, morphine. 
Um, so tramadol, meperidine, in patients with MAOIs taking them, don't give those two drugs. Remember that SSRIs, TCAs, tricyclic antidepressants, and SNRIs also interact with MAOIs and can raise serotonin levels and cause the serotonin syndrome when they're combined together. Remifentanil. Potency is very similar to fentanyl, about 100 times as potent as morphine. The rapid onset as compared to fentanyl, which is about 6.4 minutes, Remifentanil is only about 1.1 minute. It's metabolized by nonspecific plasma and tissue esterases, so don't confuse this with pseudocolon esterase. Um, independent metabolism of renal or hepatic failure but we're still going to decrease that dose in the elderly because they're more sensitive. Their brains are more sensitive to opioids. So if someone had a dibuquine number of 20, you'd say, aha, that's abnormal. Uh, dibuquine should be 80% inhibition of pseudocholinesterase, but pseudocholinesterase is not involved in the metabolism of remifentanil, and so you're going to have no change in its metabolism. The context-sensitive half-time of remifentanil is really good for long duration infusions. In fact, um, it's pretty much flat over long periods of time and the context sensitive half time is about four minutes, meaning the time from you shut it off to the, uh, it, it decreases its uh, plasma concentration in half. So it's a good drug for long term infusions, but it is associated with this hyperalgesia or increased pain that uh, patients who are taken for some period of time can have. Opioids, agonist and antagonist, now bufine, acts not only at the mu receptor, but also at the kappa receptor. Um, and uh, it is an antagonist blocker at the mu receptor. So if you give nalbufine to someone who's taking an opioid, like heroin, you could precipitate withdrawal symptoms in that opioid-dependent patient. Occasionally, nalbufine is used for labor analgesia. Buprenorphine can be combined with naloxone, which is suboxone, which you'll see in patients who are taking, who uh, are getting it as treatment for opioid addiction. It's a mixed agonist antagonist, um, and uh, again, naloxone combined with it, remember, has a uh, antagonism at the mu receptor, and buprenorphine has a high affinity for the mu receptor. Naloxone, or Narcan, will reverse all opioid effects, including analgesia, such that if you have a patient who's been given opioids and you blast them with naloxone, large dose, you can get complete antagonism of the opioid effects. If they have pain on board and you suddenly take away all their analgesia, of course, they're going to be hypertensive, tachycardiac. They could have ventricular dysrhythmias from the stress response and high catecholamines that are associated with such. They can have pulmonary uh, uh, vascular constriction and pulmonary edema. Probably this pulmonary edema is related to uh, severe pulmonary hypertension. And remember that naloxone not only has these bad side effects like hypertension, tachycardia, dysrhythmias, and pulmonary edema, but also it only lasts about 60 minutes, as does flumazenil, the reversal agent for benzodiazepines. So if you gave a long-acting opioid like methadone or morphine, and they got overdosed, and you gave naloxone to reverse it, in 60 minutes after you gave uh, the naloxone, they may start to have uh, re-sedation because naloxone only lasts about 60 minutes. Opioids, codeine pharmacogenetics, and pharmacogenetics of other opioids. First of all, it's important to realize that codeine is a prodrug. That means it has to be converted to something else, which is it's converted by the enzyme CYP2D6, which is a cytochrome P450 enzyme involved in a large number of drugs in our body, about a fourth of all drugs uh, metabolism. It's metabolized to morphine to make it active. So we have to have that normal enzyme present for codeine, codeine to be converted to morphine and have its analgesic effect or bioactivation to its active form. Tramadol is converted to M1, oxycodone to oxymorphone, hydrocodone to hydromorphone. So you can see why this CYP2D6 enzyme is so important and that if you have genetic variation in it, which there is, there can be some problems. For example, as many as 7% of Caucasians may have a defective gene such that codeine is not converted to morphine, and so you, 
codeine is like taking water basically and it's not bioactivated and conversely there can be patients who have rapid metabolism or rapid or ultra metabolizers would convert a lot of codeine to morphine and have even a greater effect so in the graphic on the right you can follow codeine over here and the CYP2D6 enzyme where the red arrow is to morphine and that is its bioactivation but you can also see bioactivation of hydrocodone to hydromorphone and you can see oxycodone to oxymorphone so this enzyme very important in the genetics of such could change the response to opioids that we administer opioids and abuse and some definitions physical dependence that implies that uh, when you are taking an opioid for a period of time you're adapted to it such that if the drug is stopped you're going to have uh, withdrawal uh, symptoms so abrupt cessation or rapid dose reduction and decreasing blood levels of the drug results in withdrawal that means you're physically dependent if you have withdrawal when it's stopped tolerance is where <clears throat> um, there's a diminution of one of the drug's effects over time. You just need more and more to get the same effect um, and, or you're becoming tolerant to the drug. Addiction, however, is not withdrawal per se. Addiction is when um, you have behaviors that include one or more of the following. Your loss of control over the drug use, uncontrollable compulsion to use, and you continue to use despite harm and craving. So those are the definitions of dependence, associated withdrawal, tolerance with diminution of the drug's effect, and addiction where you have an uncontrolled compulsion. Let's talk about intravenous induction agents now, starting with thiopental, which most of you will not have used or will not use, but methohexatol is a barbiturate that is still available in some hospitals. Mechanism of barbiturates is the GABA receptor, just like all of our other intravenous agents, uh, except ketamine. When you uh, facilitate GABA receptor, chloride conductance goes up, and the more chloride inside the cell, the more negative it is, hyperpolarizes that cell, and it doesn't fire. The awakening from thiopental and most of our drugs is due to redistribution, that is, moving away from the central compartment, the brain, to other compartments, like the muscle, and then finally the fat. Thiopental has a very slow metabolism, about 10 hour half-life, meaning that if it takes three half-lives to get rid of a drug, that's 30 hours before it's gone from the body, and you can see why it was associated with um, a hangover. In the central nervous system, thiopental puts the brain to sleep. It doesn't need as much oxygen or use as much oxygen, so CMRO2 goes down, and if uh, oxygen needs go down, blood flow is auto-regulated to it, the cerebral vasculature vasoconstricts, reduces blood flow, so both metabolism and blood flow go down. ICP can go down if there's less blood in the head, and intraocular pressure actually goes down, just like most of our induction and volatile agents. EEG burst suppression and flattening can occur with high doses, and in uh, some instit institutions and situations, barbiturates can be used for, quote, neuroprotection um, with patients who are having focal ischemic events but it's not beneficial with global ischemia such as CPR events. A barbiturate coma, when you put someone into a barbiturate coma, the barbiturates are often used to suppress seizures when the patient is having status epilepticus or if they're brain injured to reduce cerebral metabolism and uh, uh, ICP in those specific uh, scenarios. Methohexatol or Brevitol is used in electroconvulsive therapy one of the best ones for that because it prolongs the seizures as opposed to propofol which can stop the seizures and during ECT you want seizures to occur. Um, <clears throat> like Brevitol, Atomidate can also activate epileptic foci. But we're focusing on barbiturates right now and methylhexatol, a barbiturate, is used in electroconvulsive therapy because it facilitates epileptic foci. Cardiovascularly, uh, barbiturates uh, decrease blood pressure. They do so by vasodilating the patient and venodilating. If venodilation occurs, preload goes down. It also uh, 
uh, blunts the baroreceptor response, but not nearly as much as propofol, so the heart rate can go up some as the blood pressure drops. So reflexive tachycardia occurs. There's some negative inotropy also. So hypotension can occur with thiopental, but not as much as propofol. The elderly, we decrease the dose of thiopental and methylhexetol. Uh, instead of a pharmacodynamic reason of a brain sensitivity, like when we were talking with opioids, in this case, it's a pharmacokinetic reason. I like to think of it as I give the barbitrate, it goes up to the brain, it just sits there and doesn't redistribute as rapidly, and so we don't need as much. And so we, um, we say the elderly are just as sensitive pharmacodynamically to the barbitrates, but pharmacokinetically, that's the reason why we decrease the dose. Enzyme induction with barbitrates. You expose someone to phenobarbital who, for example, has seizures. Their enzymes in their liver are ramped up and can metabolize some other drugs. And chronic administration of barbitrates can decrease the dose of drugs that require those enzymes to chew them up. If we have lots of microsomal enzymes sitting around and we give someone midazolam, midazolam is going to get chewed up and chronic administration of barbitrates can decrease the duration of action of midazolam. Opioid prodrugs, uh, you can actually ramp up the enzymes that convert the prodrugs to their active form and actually increase the active form. You can have increased metabolism of oral anticoagulants and phenytoin that are also broken down by those enzymes. Um, and uh, acute intermittent porphyria is an example where we would not use barbiturates because barbiturates can uh, stimulate the, uh, an ALA synthetase enzyme, which makes more porphyrin, which precipitates acute intermittent porphyric crisis. So a contraindication to barbiturates is AIP, acute intermittent porphyria. In the central nervous system, uh, let's uh, talk about propofol's effects as well as the cardiovascular effects of propofol. In the brain, propofol reduces cerebral metabolism, CMRO2, and if oxygen use goes down, blood flow goes down, and that was just the same as the barbiturates, and also can in, uh, reduce intracranial pressure. What's different about propofol, however, is that propofol decreases mean arterial pressure the most because it vasodilates as well as blocks the baroreceptor uh, reflex increase in heart rate. So if MAP drops a lot and ICP drops a little, you can see how cerebral perfusion pressure, which is MAP minus ICP, could be adversely affected. Someone with uh, high ICP, uh, you give propofol, the ICP may go down a lot, but mean arterial pressure goes down a real lot and negatively impacts CPP. We can cause burst suppression and even flattening of the EG with propofol, just like we did with uh, the barbiturates, and also which will show that we can do with the volatile agents in 2-MAC and above concentrations. When someone goes off to sleep with propofol, we sometimes will see twitching or spontaneous movement, but we see that classically with automidate, those myoclonic movements. With ECTs, we said that brevitol or methylhexadol is one of the best. Propofol actually can shorten seizure activity, and with ECT therapy for depression, you want the patient to have seizures, so using propofol as your induction agent uh, may not make that uh, a good ECT, meaning an ECT associated with prolonged uh, seizure activity. Cardiovascular effects of propofol, we said they vasodilate uh, and inhibit baroreceptor responses and are a negative inotrope, so blood pressure drops dramatically, and it does it the most of our induction agents because of it inhibiting the baroreceptor response, you don't get the reflex tachycardia. Propofol infusion syndrome, when does that occur? Classically, it's in the ICU and a patient has been receiving propofol as an infusion for an extended period of time, and it's probably related to the high lipid lobe and a problem with the mitochondria. The mitochondria are poisoned for some reason or not working well. You can understand why a patient might develop heart failure and rhabdomyolysis, and it presents as uh, unexpected changes in heart rate, metabolic acidosis, a heart that's just not functioning very well, and then uh, finally bradycardia resistant to drugs and uh, occasionally death. So propofol infused for an extended period of time can cause this propofol infusion syndrome. Bacterial growth, um, lipid emulsion preparation can support it, and if you 
open a propofol bottle and there's not any preservatives in it, you have a short period of time in which you should use it. Otherwise, it can grow bacteria if it's left open. Atomidate next. What does it do to the brain? The same thing as the other agents does. It reduces oxygen use and blood flow and intracranial pressure. But it doesn't drop MAP, so the cerebral perfusion pressure, MAP minus ICP, can uh, be uh, maintained better with atomidate than it can with propofol. It may activate seizure foci, and myoclonus is not uncommon in patients who you put to sleep with atomidate. They start to move their muscles, um, and uh, it almost looks like a seizure sometimes. Adrenal cortical suppression, atomidate inhibits 11-beta hydroxylase, an enzyme which is important for converting cholesterol all the way down to cortisol. So you have decreased synthesis of corticosteroids, glucocorticoids that is, but also mineral corticoids, which we don't talk about very much. It's for a short period of time and it's rarely a clinical issue, but if you infuse atomidate for a long period of time, that definitely could be a problem. And in patients who are already cortisol depleted, like an Addisonian patient or an ICU patient in high-dose catecholamine infusions, um, uh, atomidate could cause some problems. But single dose, uh, a short period of inhibition of cortisol production. Patients vomit more after atomidate. Um, therefore, the name vomitate, some people give it. Pain on injection, it hurts almost as much as propofol. And uh, in a small IV in the back of the hand, uh, it can be uh, causing a lot of pain when you induce a patient. Much more than uh, thiopental and ketamine doesn't hurt. So the ones that you should associate with pain on injection are really propofol and atomidate mainly. Ketamine does not work at the, classically anyway, at the GABA receptor like the other induction agents, atomidate, barbiturates, and propofol. It works at the NMDA receptor, blocking its activity um, and it will decrease excitatory transmitter activity. It causes dissociative anesthesia. What is that? That is dissociation of the thalamus from the cortex, such that pain signals, I imagine them coming up from, let's say, an incision in the leg, up your spine, uh, crossing over and going to your thalamus, but then never making it to the cortex and dissociating it from sensation, or the interpretation of sensation, which is what your cortex does. Cardiovascular effects, when you give ketamine, there's endogenous release of catecholamines, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, pulmonary artery pressures can go up, and so someone with pulmonary hypertension, ketamine may not be the wisest choice as it raises norepinephrine levels and constrict the pulmonary arteries. It, in general, stimulates cardiac contractility if you have an intact neurologic system, but in patients that have autonomic nervous system dysfunction, like someone who's had a spinal cord transection at a high level, or an ICU patient who's been on multiple infusions of inotropes and vasopressors, you may see the direct myocardial depressant effect of ketamine it can be unmasked in these patients. If ketamine is given to someone with an intact uh, sympathetic system, they're going to have increased heart rate and blood pressure, cardiac work goes up, they can use more oxygen, and in patients with coronary artery disease, this may not be good. Some other effects and side effects of ketamine. Bronchodilation from its raising catecholamines. It causes uh, increased secretions from its sympathetic cholinergic mediated effects. Patients wake up weird, emergence delirium that can be increased if you've given atropine, which crosses the blood brain barrier, uh, as opposed to glycopyrrolate, which does not. And those drugs are given, glycopyrrolate to decrease the secretions that are associated with ketamine administration. Like opioids, it may not change the bis much. So if you gave an anesthetic with ketamine infusion with remifentanil, uh, you may have a bis that's reading up in the high numbers and have a blitzed patient very deeply anesthetized. So bis, not a great way of monitoring ketamine anesthesia. What about uh, the EEG, SSEP, and bis effects of our drugs? First, the EEG. Classically, as you're put to sleep with IV induction agents, the frequency goes down. They slow. But not only do they slow, but the amplitude goes up. And that classically happens with propofol, thiopental, and atomidate. This slowing towards the delta and theta waves and away from the alpha and beta waves, the decreased frequency, 
and the higher amplitude. The exception is the opioids and the ketamine. Several can activate seizure foci, and we use those during ECT as well as seizure surgery, and that's brevitol or methylhexatol and atomidate. SSEPs, if we're monitoring uh, during back surgery, for example, uh, most of our anesthetics will make the signal take longer to get through and decrease the amplitude, making it harder to read the SSEP signal. But it's the volatile anesthetics um, and that do it really badly, but many of our IV anesthetics also make it harder to monitor SSEPs. But the exception is atominate and ketamine because they can actually make the amplitude a little bit higher. So if you are anesthetizing someone for just SSEPs with a volatile anesthetic in low concentration, let's say, and you substituted some of that with atominate and ketamine, that volatile anesthetic, you would expect the amplitude to go up. We often incorporate MEPs now, or motor evoked potentials, with SSEPs. In that situation, patients are extremely sensitive, their MEPs to volatile anesthetics. We would use a TIVA-based anesthetic in almost all situations, Remy, fentanyl, propofol. We cannot use neuromuscular blockade or you would not get motor evoked potential signals. BIS, opioids, ketamine, and nitrous oxide, as previously discussed, confound the use of BIS as a monitor of hypnosis because they don't have the usual EEG effect of decreasing the frequency and increasing the amplitude like our other anesthetics do. Here's a question for you. All other factors being equal, if a patient was anesthetized with propofol as compared to ketamine, they would more likely demonstrate which of the following. So propofol. Greater analgesia with propofol? No. Lower BIS number? Absolutely. Higher cerebral blood flow? No. Lower cerebral blood flow. Higher pulmonary vascular resistance? No. Ketamine raises the uh, sympathetic nervous system tone and catecholamine levels and can cause pulmonary vascular resistance increases. So the answer to that would be a lower BIS number with propofol as compared to ketamine. Obesity and intravenous anesthetics. How do we dose our drugs? Well, going back to uh, neuromuscular blocking agents, the non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agent uh, like rocuronium, vecuronium, and pancuronium, there's little change in volume and distribution with obesity, and we tend to dose it by a deal body weight, but add about 20% more to include their extra lean mass. But with succinylcholine, we increase the dose because obesity tends to be associated with increased pseudocholinesterase activity, the enzyme that breaks down uh, succinylcholine. What about lipophilic drugs, these induction drugs that we've been talking about? They have a large fat stores, these obese patients, and a large volume of distribution. And you will have to have a larger loading dose be required to produce the same plasma concentration. But most people will uh, dose based upon, let's say, uh, ideal body weight plus 20% or something like that, rather than just dosing to their real, uh, real weight. Remy fentanyl pharmacokinetics are similar to non-obese patient. Again, dose on their ideal body weight. And awakening times, even though there's all this extra adipose tissue around, uh, if it's not a super long anesthetic with inhaled volatile anesthetics, very similar awakening between obese and non-obese patients with des, sevoflurane, and isoflurane. But desflurane would have some advantages because of its low blood gas solubility with long periods of volatile anesthetic administration with regards to awakening times. Let's look at nitrous oxide uh, as we move into the inhaled anesthetics. It actually can increase cerebral blood flow in the head as opposed to the intravenous agents, which reduced it. And it also may decrease the SSEP signal. MAC is 105%, so at sea level, we cannot even provide one MAC of anesthesia with nitrous oxide. A weak uh, weak uh, gaseous anesthetic. At 0.5 mac, 0 0.5 times about 760, that'd be about 400 millimeters of mercury. Um, if we were able to administer in a hyperbaric conditions, like two atmospheres, then we could administer one mac of nitrous oxide. But even 50% uh, uh, or 0.5 mac uh, the rest of it needs to be oxygen in many cases, uh, so we cannot even provide one mac of anesthesia at sea level. Cardiovascular wise, the nitrous oxide stimulates the sympathetic nervous system and can have a slight increase in heart rate and blood pressure and cardiac output. 
and it can, can, can increase the pulmonary vascular resistance in adults. And so patients with pulmonary hypertension, remember ketamine was a vasoconstrictor of the pulmonary vasculature. Nitrous oxide can increase pulmonary vascular resistance. So these are two anesthetics, nitrous and ketamine, that uh, probably should be avoided in patients with severe pulmonary hypertension. Now, a classic respiratory uh, issue with nitrous oxide is this diffusion hypoxia, which is demonstrated in the graphic on the right. Diffusion hypoxia, we do not see in general uh, in the OR because we don't awaken patients on room air. So let's create a scenario where you're in a dental office breathing, let's say, 50% nitrous oxide through a nasal mask, and at the end of the operation, the nasal mask is taken off and you're breathing room air. What happens is this, and the graphic at the bottom shows it quite well. The nitrous oxide rushes into the alveolus from the blood and it dilutes the oxygen that's in your alveolus such that the oxygen in your alveolus drops dramatically and your saturation could drop temporarily and for a short period of time as the nitrous oxide leaves your body. Uh, and that's called diffusion hypoxia. How do you avoid that? Just give a little supplemental oxygen at the end of your anesthetic and you avoid this, cons this problem of diffusion hypoxia. Other problems with nitrous oxide, megaloblastic anemia and peripheral neuropathy because nitrous oxide oxidizes the cobalt atom in B12 and inhibits the methionine synthetase enzyme that's necessary for myelin formation and DNA formation. So we're messing with formation of the covering of nerves and DNA formation when you chronically expose someone to nitrous oxide. Someone who abuses nitrous oxide and you draw a blood specimen, you may see macrocytic anemia and also they may have a glove stocking like peripheral neuropathy. Tergigenic effects, the pregnant patient, we tend to avoid nitrous oxide because of the possibility of such. And we know that nitrous oxide expands those nitrogen-filled air spaces because nitrous oxide is much more soluble than nitrogen and it rushes into those air-filled spaces and nitrogen can't leave fast enough and the space expands. And an air embolism, a pneumothorax, tension pneumocephalus when they close the dura and air is trapped under it and you were giving nitrous oxide that uh, uh, that air underneath the dura could expand and cause pneumocephalus in the brain. Bullous cysts in the lung, someone with really bad COPD could blow a cyst. The middle ear grafts could be blown off in ENT surgery. If sulfur fluoride uh, Hexafluoride gas was used as an intraocular gas, such as in retinal detachment surgery, when the ophthalmologist puts the SF6 gas in to force the retina back against the eyeball, back of the eye, that that gas stays around for a while, and if you give nitrous oxide in the next four to six weeks, that sulfur hexafluoride gas bubble could expand, retinal detachment could occur, and intraocular pressure also could go up. We know the cuff of our endotracheal tube over time builds up its pressure and we know the pressure should be less than about 25 to 30 centimeters of water if we don't want the blood flow underneath our cuff and our trachea to be, uh, uh, the capillary blood flow to be decreased dramatically. So we need to let air out of the cuff over time if we're administering nitrous oxide and we have an endotracheal tube in place. Then the classic bowel distension, 50% nitrous oxide, two times the bowel gas volume in several hours and 75% uh, uh, nitrous oxide can increase it four times. The tanks, green is oxygen, blue is nitrous oxide. This blue colored tank has both liquid and gas mixture in it when it's given to you in the full state. The reason for the fact that nitrous oxide can be provided as a liquid and a gaseous state is the critical temperature. Notice that oxygen is supplied in our tanks only in the gas state. Nitrous oxide has a critical temperature of 36.4. That's the temperature at which above no amount of pressure can cause it to go from the gaseous to the liquid state. So because our temperature is less than 36.4, pressure can be applied to it and convert the gas into a liquid state. So nitrous can be liquefied by pressure. Oxygen has a critical temperature down below minus 100 degrees, so in our operating room we cannot provide oxygen as a liquid and a gaseous state together. It's just a gas. A full tank of nitrous oxide uh, 
about 1600 liters and it's going to measure 750 psi and continue to read 750 psi until there is no more liquid left in the tank to release gas up into the gaseous phase and at that point you only have about 25 percent of the tank left so one-fourth of 1600 liters is 400 liters left in the tank when the dial starts to go down and to really know how much is in the tank you have to weigh it when liquids present um, uh, and know the tear weight of the tank also and subtract the two. MAC is our last concept in this part two. MAC is highest at about six months of age. There's some things that can increase and decrease MAC. Increase it, anything that raises central neurotransmitters. If someone is using amphetamines acutely, uh, their catecholamines are so high in their head it takes more anesthetic to put them to sleep. That's the way at least, at least I like to think of it. If their temperature goes up, if they're um, uh, chronically using alcohol, or if they're hypernatremic. Now things that decrease MAC as you age, uh, over age 40, about 8 to 10 percent per decade, or maybe uh, as low as 6 depending on which book you read per decade after age 40, uh, there definitely is a decrement in MAC as you age, and if you get cold. So the two things that you should probably remember about MAC, aged patients and cold patients reduces MAC, but also that pregnancy, progesterone is increased, decreases MAC. If you're already intoxicated acutely with alcohol, you're already half asleep, doesn't require much of the volatile anesthetic to put you the rest of the way to sleep. And if you combine other anesthetics, IV lidocaine, midazolam, fentanyl, all decrease MAC. Now, MAC of a volatile anesthetic correlates with the solubility in olive oil. This is not blood gas solubility, which blood gas solubility correlates with the onset and the offset of the anesthetic state and the rapidity of development of FA over FI, which we're going to demonstrate later. But MAC correlates with the solubility of the anesthetic in olive oil. The more soluble it is, uh, the more potent it tends to be. MAC as we said, decreases with age. We know that ne neonates and premature infants are lower than that six month where it's the highest MAC. MAC in sevoflurane is a little bit different in the fact that neonates and infants, the MAC is about 3.2%. In older infants, it's about 2.5%. So this is a little bit different from the classic. And we should really be thinking of MAC as a partial pressure. And that is, if we say the MAC of desflurane at with 50% of patients won't move to incision is 6% and tidal and at one atmosphere that means that 6% of one atmosphere or 6% of 760 millimeters of mercury equals 46 millimeters of mercury so instead of 6% we really should be saying the MAC of desfluorine is 46 millimeters of mercury but that would be pretty difficult to communicate in the operating room. It is partial pressure not the percentage that's the driving force for the anesthetic to cross the lipid membranes of your brain and have their effect. MAC bar stands for block adrenergic response and you know that MAC awake is 0.3, that MAC is 1, that you have to go up to 1.3 times MAC to prevent 95 percent of patients from moving to incision and you have to go all the way up to 1.5 times MAC to keep 50 percent of patients from having an adrenergic response um, uh, to uh, incision or stimulation. Meyer-Overton principles was an attempt to correlate lipid solubility and potency. That is, the more potent an anesthetic was, uh, the uh, more lipid soluble it tended to be, or conversely, the more lipid soluble, the more potent. And you could graph those along a straight line, lipid solubility and potency. But this was an attempt to uh, discuss how anesthetics work, but we know now that volatile anesthetic site of action is proteins in the membrane and receptors themselves, not uh, per se dissolving in the lipid membrane like we talked about in the past in an attempt to have a unitary hypothesis or an explanation of how volatile anesthetics work. Volatile anesthetic site of action is the proteins in the membrane and the receptors in the membrane. This ends part two of a three-part series, Anesthesia Pharmacology Keyword Review 2018, and I hope you have a great day.